My name is Commander, Commanding Philosopher, Poison Tongue, the most consistent, predictable, schedule driven streamer out there. It's been a while, been a, been a good while since I've done this. Honestly, I had started to lose a little bit of interest. Because nothing, it's, it's kind of taken second place to some of the other creative endeavors and bigger projects that I've been working on. So, streaming, at times it has felt more like it just kind of got in the way of doing my other things. And so, that's why I kept uh, cancelling, kept delaying. But the project is nearing its completion. And after that, I'm going to take a, a small little break from creating stuff like that. So I should be more available and more interested in doing some more streaming. Because we all know I have a whole bunch of stuff that I want to get through. At least 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10... At least 10 more streams worth of stuff that I want to get... Uh, 11. 11 streams worth of stuff that I want to get through. And... I kind of want to get to them. I kind of I kind of want to do them. But not at the... Not if it makes me feel like it's just getting in the way of doing something else. So, once that something else is over, and before I start the next one, I'll, I'll focus on streaming a little bit. Doing a couple more extra fun stuff that again, has also been in the, in the pipeline for a while. <sighs> make sure you got your water, make sure you're hydrated. Today, we are going to be doing a little chat, a little philosophy, a little, not so much philosophy, more like a little teaching moment. Today, we're going to be talking about, well, can you hear me? Hold on. Yep, you can hear me. Okay, perfect. Stream is healthy. I'm streaming zero audio bitrate, but I, I defy that. So today, I want to talk about some things that are lessons that I've learned. It's all about learning today. And I don't want to discredit anything that you're learning in school. I don't want to discredit any of... Any, that's the, oh, hang on. I need to... My avatar is way off, of course, off-center. Hang on. One moment, please. And that, yes. That way, go that way, up, down, perfect. That should be good. Perfect. That's awesome. Fixes on the fly. Perfect segue into one of the things we're going to talk about today. So, what was I saying? I was saying I don't want to discredit anything that is officially taught. Again, I am not a teacher. I am not here to usurp any official lessons you are getting. I'm simply here to share my own thoughts, my own opinions, and hopefully it could enrich your life. But today is less about making. I know I'm all about making stuff, making projects, creative expression, but this is more about a little more on the academic side of things. I'm talking about learning. Learning how to learn. Learning how to fail. And learning how to recover from mistakes you make. Now, before we get too far into this, this came about from going through college, really. And by the end of my time there, in discussions with my classmates and with other teachers, you learn all this knowledge. You gain all this knowledge. You know, if you take 
physics classes or art history classes or literature classes. You learn these facts. You learn how to do calculus. You learn how to analyze a piece of artwork. You know dates and uh, historical events. You have all this stuff that you've learned. And the running joke is 90% of it you won't use in your daily life, in your job. But what they don't teach you explicitly, in my experience at least, what they don't have a course for is probably one of the things that is the most valuable thing to learn when you're in school. One of the things that by the end of I'm not going to say by the end of high school, but definitely at the end of college, you should have learned. And this is more of a thing you've learned on your own, rather than something that is taught to you. And that's exactly the three things I said. So we're going to go through them in order. What in the world am I talking about? So learning how to learn. Learning to learn. That sounds a bit silly. It sounds like you're just saying the same thing twice. What does it mean to learn how to learn? You learn things, you learn facts, you learn skills, you learn stuff that people teach you from books, from lectures, from classes, from homework. You learn things. But learning to learn? Doesn't quite make sense at first. That's why it's so difficult to know whether you've learned it or how well you've learned it. Learning how to learn. People learn in different ways. Some people learn best from sitting in a lecture hall or in a classroom in the back where they see the entire board, the whole teacher, and all the students, their classmates in front of them gauging the mood of the room, also seeing the entirety of the material as a whole. Some people learn best from sitting down in a room, opening the textbook and just reading, maybe taking notes. Some people learn best by sitting in the front row, whether it's a class of 20 or a class of 200. All you see are you and the teacher, and almost everyone else behind you doesn't exist. And you can raise questions, they'll see you first. Raise your hand, ask questions, they'll see you first. And it's just like a personal lesson where you engage. Some people learn best by not engaging at all and just watching. If you're trying to take notes, some people learn best by writing everything down by hand. Others learn best by typing it all on a laptop. And yet some people don't learn at all during the actual presentation of the material, they learn best by doing the homework, by discussing it in groups, by working on projects, by actually putting what they're trying to learn into practice. So there's many different ways that people could learn, and people are more favorable, more open to learning one way or another. Some ways work better for different people. Me, for instance, I learn best by being in the front. I'm in the front, I can make eye contact with the teacher as they're teaching something. I get to see exactly what they're writing, but I also get to see what they're trying to teach. I can do that nonverbal communication with them. Read their body language, their facial expressions, and they can read mine. If I look puzzled, they'll see it on my face much more clearly than someone 200 feet away in the back of the room. If I ask a question, I don't need to shout, I don't need to yell, I'm right there. If I'm in the front, it's more likely that I'll get my question chosen. To, to ask. I also learn very well from actually discussing things rather than just sitting there listening, 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 
may be falling asleep, but listening, I actually engage because it makes me think about it as it's being taught, which cements it further into my mind. And as for note-taking, I learn much better writing it down by hand. Hands down, excuse the pun, but hands down, I cannot retain what I write down in my mind if I type it. Because if you, the way I think about it, and the way it happens for me, if you want to write the word, let's say, fin, what's a, what's a good word? I'm trying to look. Uh, favor. No, that's not, a, that's not an example. Fit. That's a good example. A little preview for a future stream. Fit. Try to write the word fit. If you're trying to define what fit means, if you're fit for something, if you're a good fit for a certain job or position, and try to discuss the nuances of what counts, what doesn't count, either for job applications or for, you know, fitting in social groups and other such. If you're trying to write the word fit and that's the title, and it's all about that, how do you write that? Well, I write with my hand. My left, I'm a lefty, left hand. And I always, <laughs> funny story, a little tangent. I write in cursive. Pretty much exclusively I write in cursive. I learned in like fifth grade how to write in cursive and I have not stopped since. So all of middle school, all of high school, all of college, all of grad school, all of my job, I learned and I only wrote in cursive. And I tell this to people, I'm not, I'm less certain now that it's true, but I feel like around middle of, for like a, a week in high school, I forgot or my mind completely blanked on how to write in print. Because I've been writing in cursive exclusively. I could read print just fine, it's everywhere. But actually making the motions of the print and separation between every single letter, it was so unnatural and different than how I've been writing for the past few years, it, it did not come naturally anymore. I can do it now, but there was a time where I couldn't write in print or completely forgot. Now I can do both. I still prefer cursive. But yeah, so if I'm writing the word fit, I do the two swoops of the F, the little bump of the I, the bigger bump, and the cross with the T. So the physical motion of my hand making the letters adds a physical... What's the word? It's not reassurance. It's reinforcement. It's a physical reinforcement of the word that I'm writing down because the motion is unique to that word. And the sequence of hand motions for the sequence of letters is also unique to that word. So it's like engaging muscle memory while I'm thinking about it in my head. So now I know what I'm writing down and I can remember it better. If I'm typing it, I click index finger down for F on the left hand, middle finger up on the right hand for I, and the middle f index finger up for T. Well, the index finger it could be F, it could be G, it could be R, it could be T, it could be V. Middle finger for the right hand could be K, it could be I, it could be M. I mean, not M, comma. And T, it's the same as essential motion as an F. So it's a lot less unique for the word, it's a lot less personal, and you're always going back and forth with your fingers so it's not really unique to whatever word you're saying. So for me, typing doesn't help me retain as much, but writing it down, it does. And the other weird thing that happens is, oh, I forgot how much I go off on tangents on these things, but the other thing that happens is as I write, because it takes longer, I type, I learned, wow, tangent after another. Okay, so in early high school, I, we had courses, we had classes to learn how to type. Because up until then, I've been typing mostly with just like one hand. I got really good with typing one hand. Uh, I think it was my, my left hand. 
probably because I'm a lefty, but typing and using my pinky for like the Q and the A and the Z, and my thumb for like the space and the M, and all over that. But then I learned how to type properly, and the best part was for like the first month of the courses, they took away your backspace. So whatever mistakes you made, you had to live with, and that was part of your score. So they taught us how to use the basic four, the basic eight uh, keys for your fingers without your thumb, and then uh, either right thumb or left thumb for your, for your space bar, and then we started branching into the other word, other letters, and then we went up to the number keys, and then we went over to the number pad on the right, which I still use all the time. But after that, we learned how to type, and I got really good and really fast. So even now, I can type words faster than I can write them by hand. So writing notes by hand may seem to slow down how many notes you take, but that works to my advantage. Because as I'm writing the word, it gives my brain time to think. It's not, okay, you write a word and you have no time to think about anything else because your word is finished. You have to do the next word. You type it real quick, then the next word. Type it real quick, next word. Type it real quick. And your brain doesn't have time to really process what you're typing because you're typing it faster than it has time to do so. If you write, or for me, if I write, if I'm writing the word toughen, like toughen up, T-O-U-G-H-E-N, T-O-U... By the time I get to like the, the start of the G, I'm pretty, pretty much cemented in my head the word that I'm trying to write, toughen. All the letters that follow, T-O-U-G-H-E-N, I write that down. So while I'm writing the G-H-E-N, the last bit, I don't need to think about what I'm writing. I don't need to think about a whole lot of what comes uh, right next, because I've already got that. My brain has time to sort of absorb and flesh out. And that leads to other tangential thoughts. It leads to other little footnotes, other side things to write to really give context to what I'm writing. So, for instance, if I'm writing, um, like, definition of fit. Let's go back to that example. The definition of fit. So that's about how long it would take to write that phrase. And if I was typing it, it'd probably be definition of fit. So I tried to mime it out with my fingers as fast as I would. So if I was typing it, let's see, definition of fit. That's pretty quick. So if I'm writing it by hand, definition of fit. You see how it's such a long time. But while I'm doing that, I don't normally speak while I write. This is just for streaming demonstration purposes. But when I write, my mind has time to go and figure out, okay, what else do I need to know about this in order to remember it? Because if I just write definition of fit, I'm not going to remember what the definition was. I just say, here's a definition, but it's not defined. So I would write it down, and while I'm writing it, I'm thinking about, okay, what else do I write? I write this little note to myself, and that little note to myself, and I say, this is here because this is why, and like, rationale, and all that stuff. So, writing by hand cements what I'm learning so much better than typing it with my fingers because of the uniqueness of the hand motion, because the extra time it takes, which is interpreted as the extra time that my mind is allowed to really process, understand, cement, and link what I'm writing to things that I already know, things that already exist in my mind. Take that little piece of the jug jigsaw puzzle and put it in and see where it goes, what pieces are around it, and how that completes the bigger picture. So yeah, I, it's not, for me, it's not just that I learn best by writing. It's like almost I can't really learn by typing. It's not that it doesn't work as well. It almost works against me by typing it out. But that is something that I learned in school. It wasn't taught to me, but I learned by handwriting over typing. That is how I learn, and I learned how I learn by the end of college. Now, I'm not saying that the end of college, but graduating there is your hard deadline, or 
for learning this stuff. But eventually, it should be something that you explore on your own, something that you come to realize as you go through, and things that will definitely help you. Because now, I can go to any other class or any meeting at school or work or anything, and I always bring a notebook and a pencil, a little a very fancy, I actually went to Office Depot a couple years ago and got a high quality, very, very comfortable mechanical pencil with like number, I think it's number three pencil. Number two pencil is like the common one, but number three pencil lead and like a fancy eraser, very comfortable grip, very, very strong and present in the hand and it's, it's been my go-to pencil for ever since I got them. It's a really good mechanical pencil, but I take this over a pen or a decent pen any day because I love the feel, the scratch of a pencil on paper. That's how I learn. So I go and yes, yeah, sometimes I bring my computer, sometimes I bring a, a, something digital to keep notes in, but writing it by hand can't be that. That means I know what I'm writing and I can remember it. If I didn't learn that about myself, I might still be struggling. I might be typing it on, on a computer and wondering why I'm not remembering this stuff. But because I learned this about myself, I'm better for it. And I can learn better. So that's like for note taking. What about learning it in, the, in a group setting? in a school setting, teacher, student, lecture hall of 20, a classroom of 20, lecture hall of 200, anything in between. How do you learn? How do you learn best in that scenario? Do you learn at all in that scenario? I'm not condoning this. I'm not giving advice about attendance or anything, but if you learn through your studies that you don't learn pretty much anything by attending a live lecture. I'm not saying, I want to be clear, I'm not saying you should skip them all. <laughs> I'm not saying even if for your own personal learning you gain almost nothing from being there in person. Let's say you learn best. You, It's not just an excuse to skip, but you legitimately learn best by reading through the textbook, taking notes, doing the homework, and listening to a teacher drone on in a classroom does nothing for you. Even if you know that about yourself to a definitive certainty, I'm not saying you should skip, but the fact that you know that is a good thing. Because when you do have a choice, you know, making a presence, making your presence known, making an appearance, that has value. If not for you, then for other people. Because I've been in the position of teaching and lecturing other groups. And when you're teaching a group of like two or three, it's a different feeling than if you're teaching a group of 20 or 30. And when you have all those people paying attention to you, you feel more energized, more energetic, you feel more listened to, you feel more valued as an instructor. But if they're all missing because they don't learn from you, it's a lot harder to maintain that enthusiasm. There was one moment where we actually, I was going through probably my first or second year of college and they used to have these interview seminars for like these special events mostly for the freshmen but special events where they would sit down with a, a professor or a special guest and they'd interview them ask them a couple questions usually they were held in like little lecture halls just any spare one that was open and if you were in like a certain type of um, program you might get credit for it uh, but really for everyone else they were just optional and we got a notice I think a couple days after one of them happened, uh, basically from the university saying, hey, these things are going on, uh, we would really appreciate more attendance because you don't know how hard it is 
to conduct an interview with a person, one-on-one, -on -one, two people, in a giant and completely empty lecture hall. You're being filmed, so they're recording it for later, so you still have to glance at the empty audience as if there was people there, but you're constantly, it's just the two of you in the bottom of a big empty room pretending that there's dozens of people there and there's actually no one. It's psychologically difficult to do that. And it almost makes you just want to stop and give up and it's almost disheartening to say, oh, I'm being interviewed for something I'm passionate about and no one shows up. No one wants to see it. And not through college, but through some other things afterwards, I, you know, I know what that feels like. To to put yourself out there and then have no one pay attention to it. But in the moment, while it's happening, you know. So, I'm not saying to skip classes. Not at all. Being there, even if you're, even if you're not paying attention, if you look like you're paying attention, even a modicum of attention, it makes a world of difference for the instructor, and you might actually learn something from it. It may not be the material, it may not be the course, lesson, but you'll learn something. Maybe some little fun fact about the teacher's life, or some some interesting thing that's going on in the world, or something like that. Something that wouldn't be in the class material, something that wouldn't be in a textbook, or in a homework assignment, but could still enrich your life, somehow. So, like I said, I learn best by sitting in the front row, where it's just like me and the teacher. And I've done this in the classes of 20, where it's less important to be in the front. I did in the classes of 200. I'm sitting in the front, and all I see in my peripheral is just the people to the side of me and the front. And even though the teacher looks behind me at the other 100 students that are there, while I'm learning, they're not there. And so I can see where he's going, or where she's going, what they're teaching, what they're trying to communicate. And it's a lot easier to just engage if it, if I essentially fool myself into thinking it's just a couple people. So I learned that about myself. That's, I tried sitting in the back a couple times and I, I learned that I cannot learn that way. I learned that there's so much empty space between you and the teacher and it's filled with all these other people that may or may not be paying attention. The other thing I learned, completely unrelated, is especially in college, you bring computers if you want to take notes on the laptop. Who knows if they're actually taking notes? They're going to be playing games, doing work for another class. I think I remember not sure if this is true or not, maybe a false memory, but I remember we were learning, I think, something in chemistry. And even I would admit, the chemistry teacher wasn't exactly the greatest at teaching group of 200. I think I learned later because they were used to teaching smaller classroom size. And a couple students who had this person as a guest instructor for a discussion section. Discussion sections are usually 20 to 30 group segments of the class that are like supplemental to the main lecture. Uh, they were filling in for their teaching assistant because they were out and they were like a completely different person and an incredible instructor because there was only a few people. Put them in front of a class of 200, gets a little uncomfortable, a little unsure. And so you sit in the back with that, you're not really learning anything. But I think this is one of those times early on where we were learning something about a, a molecule and this person had like a YouTube video up teaching about the same material from like a different professor in a different university on a YouTube video during their class. So <laughs> the things you see when you're in the back, they, you learn a lot of things that maybe you didn't think of learned before, but it's everyone learns their own way. I learned as a front seater and by taking handwritten notes. 
I cannot learn or I cannot retain reading through a textbook or a thick uh, hand handbook. <clears throat> but I think I learn the best, better than front seating, better better than handwriting notes. I learn the best by teaching it to others, to my peers, to my classmates. <clears throat> and that's really what happened later on in the upper level classes where it's less of classes of 200 and it's more specialized. Because in the beginning you're taking all generic classes like general math, general chemistry, general science, general literature, just to get your core classes taken care of. But as you progress throughout the semesters, you start to specialize and hone in on what it is you're actually majoring in. Classes that are more specific to that field. And so that starts to wheedle down the class sizes and allow you more flexibility and more opportunity to split yourself into little study groups or homework groups or stuff like that. And so what I learned is that if I really know this material, if I really know it, then I'm able to teach it. And if I try to teach it, I'm forced to really know every nook and cranny, every little nuance of what I'm trying to teach. If I don't, then there will be a gap in the logic. There will be a gap in the thinking, an empty space, uh, a bridge that doesn't exist between two parts of a cliff. You know what's on one side, you don't know, you know what's on the other. But you don't know how they connect. You don't know what's in between. And sometimes when you're being taught in a lecture, they only teach you little pockets, but they don't teach you the entire connecting story. But when you're teaching, you have to know it, even if you don't say all of it, even if you don't teach all of it. You know the entire thing. And you don't realize that the entire thing exists until you become the teacher. If you're taught these little pillars, but you don't know that there's little vines, or streamers if you want, party-esque, streamers, but connecting them, then you'll start teaching the pillars, but you'll sound as, and you'll feel mentally as disconnected and not really sure that you know it as you were when you taught. You were when you were taught. So that's one of the things that helps me the best. And one of the best ways that I learn and the best checks to see whether I have learned, can I teach it to someone else? Even if that someone else doesn't exist. Even if you're just teaching it to an imaginary audience where it looks like you're just talking to yourself. If you assume that your audience knows absolutely nothing about what you're teaching. You have to start from square one, from the very beginning and the very basic stuff, and you teach it from there all the way to the end of the most complicated part of what you're trying to teach, and it's just one continuous thought in your mind. All connected. All the big picture. That's how you know you really know your stuff. That's, well, that's how I know. I really know my stuff. It's like the jigsaw puzzle analogy. You are given the corners, and you're given a couple big, big chunks and pieces. But the teachers don't have all the time in the world to teach. They don't have time to give you every single piece in the lecture and tell you where they go and what other pieces they're connected to. So between the lectures give you some puzzle pieces, the homework gives you some other puzzle pieces, the textbook gives you all the other puzzle pieces, they give you all the pieces, but they don't really guide you to where they all fit, every single one. But you need to know what the entire completed puzzle looks like in order to teach it to someone else. And so that's what I realized. If I can do that, then boom, I have the entire puzzle fixed and completed in my head. 
and I know this. And this maybe this probably isn't just me, but you can tell. You can tell when you really know something. It's it's a feeling that I can't quite describe other than you feel smart. You feel confident and you 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 kind of get excited. You well, I I get this desire to teach. If for nothing else than to just show off the fact that I know this stuff. But when I really when I don't get it, I can pinpoint what I don't get because I know where my teaching just dropped, where that bridge is gone. So that's another kind of self-diagnostic self-diagnosis. Trying to teach it shows you not just that you're missing some information, but what information you're missing. So that's really how I learned. I learned how to learn through front seat lecture, handwritten notes, and teaching it to others after the fact. And I cannot really learn by reading a book, sitting in the back, or typing on a laptop. Those are things that were never explicitly taught to me. Those are things that I was never guided through by a teacher or a counselor or anyone that says, here, let's figure out how you learn so you're able to use this information later on. No, this is something that I kind of just learned about myself by naturally going through it. There are some people who know this going into college there are some people who have not yet learned this leaving. But I'm trying to encourage to inform you that yes, this is something that you can learn and you should try to figure it out because it's going to help you communicate to others if they give you, okay, we can do this this way, that way, or this other way. And you know in your head, well, this way isn't going to work because I don't learn very well from it. This way would be perfect, because I learned very well from this, and this way I can go either way. So it gives you a better way to help yourself later on in life. So learning how to learn. It almost sounds redundant on the surface, but there it is. That's how it works. checking my audio. <laughs> okay, learning how to learn. We pretty much talked that one to death. The next one. Should we do that now or should we take a small break? You know what? I'm almost out of water. I'm going to take a small five minute break because the next two are somewhat related. So we're going to take a five minute break, be back in five minutes with more water. See you soon.
get it, I get it. I don't know why it keeps doing that. They keep saying my audio bitrate is lower than recommended. My bitrate on OBS is... What is my bitrate? My audio is... Audio bitrate is 160. And YouTube says it should be... At least 128. But YouTube is also saying my current one is zero. So I have no idea what's going on. Is my audio working? Yeah, my audio is working. Perfect. Uh, okay. So one thing that came to mind, one thing that I... That I uh, thought about as I'm refilling my water is one other, other aspect to the benefit, the value of learning how you learn. Um, and this came up early on in my college days before I learned about this whole thing, that there was even a, a learning to learn kind of phenomenon. If you struggle to learn in a class or with a mentor or some other thing, it may, it may, or it may not be because of the style of learning, the style that you are being taught. One thing that I've seen happen is people go to class, they, they try to learn the way that the teacher gives them. Say the teacher says, okay, I want you to read this page to that page and then do this problem to that problem, or to write a summary of what you learned, or or even like, oh, uh, do the homework from this page to that page. I'm not going to teach it because the book has it all. Or I'm going to teach. We don't really use the book or anything like that. And uh, sometimes, oh, the homework problem is based on the lecture. The book might be different, but don't use the book. Use my lecture or anything like that. Kind of choosing how the material is presented to you. And some people struggle and they may think it's because they're they're just they're they're not smart they're they're difficult to it's difficult to understand because well they think they're dumb they think they they just don't get it because it's too difficult well no that may not be the case the case might be you're just being taught and you're just trying to force yourself or you're being forced to learn in a way that you don't learn well that could be a possibility that I want to open people's eyes to. To say, hey, if you're struggling to learn something in a class, it may not be because it's difficult. It may not be because you're dumb. It may not be because you just won't ever get it. It could be because you're trying to learn in a way that you're not compatible with and you're trying to force yourself to learn that way. For instance, I took literature class. Like I said, I don't learn or retain much at all from reading books, from reading textbooks, from reading uh, literature. It, it doesn't really stay in my mind very long because there's no engagement. There's no feedback that you can interact with it. You're just consuming, consuming, and eventually there's so much that it just starts to leave starts to leave the mind. I cannot retain from things I read. If it's not for entertainment, I can't do it. And so literature classes were a bit difficult for me. And like, uh, there was a paleontology class where the book was like two inches thick and you had to read through how to do uh, tree classes and how to trace back the lineage of different species and all that stuff. And the interactive homework that was nice. I learned. But just reading through literature, just reading through a story, trying to pick apart it analytically, like figure out what the word choice, figure out, okay, why did he say this? Does this imply this other hidden meaning? Does this mean that the, the, uh, the narrator of the story themselves is unreliable or mistaken? Learning difficulties aside, that's a fascinating concept. 
we are reading a story from the perspective of someone. What if that someone is misunderstanding what they're telling you? So now you can't even trust your own narrator. That was one of the... What was the name? Was it... Was it the turn of the screw? I think that might have been it. Let me look up, let me look this up real quick, because I think that might have been it. I think it was a turn of the screw. Turn of the screw was a, yes. No? Oh, oh, um. Yeah, it is. Turn of the Screw. So this was one of the stories that we had to read for our um, a literature course that I took in college. And mostly because my professor had been one of the editors for that collection of stories. But what, how it goes is basically there's a story told by the perspective of a particular woman. And at first glance, just an initial pass-through, it was regarded as a horror story, because they talk about ghosts and evil spirits and other stuff like that, and it wasn't until a couple years after the story had been around, I think it came out a couple decades ago, um, that they took a closer look at specific words and specific phrases that they used, and they realized there was a whole other story going on in the background that indicated that the person telling the story was delusional. So you were being told the story of what happened from the perspective of a delusional narrator, and you had to read very close attention to figure out what was actually happening. So it wasn't really a ghost story and an evil spirit story. It was a perfectly mundane story about common, non-supernatural things, but the narrator's mind just blew things out of proportion. Which is a fascinating concept, but actually reading that story and looking for that was gruesome. It was horrible. It was very boring for me, because I can't retain. I don't learn well from reading books and nothing else. So, it wasn't until later that I realized, okay, is it just me? Am I just not, did I just not, did I just get dumber going into college from high school? No, I'm just being forced to learn in a way that I am not compatible with. So that's something that I wanted to make sure I communicated is, if you're struggling to learn, it may be just the method that you're trying to learn that needs to change. Something that you may not consider at first. So just a little little ending caveat to the learning to learn idea. Now we go on to the other half of that coin. Learning to fail. Now what do I mean by learning to fail? Let me give you some examples through a question, as if I was asking you, how do you fail? Well, how do you fail? Do you fail by going into shock? Freezing up? Do you fail by losing your temper? Going into a tantrum? Do you fail by crying in a corner? Do you fail by immediately rushing to your book or your notes and finding out exactly what the right thing was? Do you fail by pretending and saying it's no big deal and moving on? Do you fail by reassessing what you learned, how what you were tested on was different, and try to figure out calmly what the right answer was? Do you fail by going straight to the teacher and demanding a regrade? 
Do you fail by thinking it's the end of the world? Do you fail by thinking it's no big deal at all? People fail many different ways. Learning how you fail currently is the first step to learning more efficient ways to fail. For instance, if you fail by throwing things, let's say you get a grade back on a test, it's uh, you thought you did really well and you get like a D minus or a D plus, let's say D plus, you get a D plus. If you fail by losing your temper, you stand up, you flip your desk, you storm out of the room, My personal opinion would be that's not a very productive or constructive way to respond to your failure. The extreme opposite might also be just as damaging to your own sense of confidence. To say, oh, you fail, you get a D minus or D plus. You thought you did well, so you immediately pour over every note and every textbook you've ever read and written and everything you had just to figure out what you did wrong. And you will not stop, you will not rest, you will not move on until you figure out every single thing you could have done to get a perfect score. Almost to an obsessive level. That, I would say, personally speaking, would be equally as unhealthy. Where either, or you just legitimately don't care at all. You get a D plus and like, eh, you throw it on the side, you throw it into your backpack, you walk out, you never think about it again. I don't think that's as dangerous, may not be the right word, but damaging might be a better word, as the rage tantrum rage quit, really, or the obsessive uh, look back at your notes method, but it's still not, it's still also not really helping you to not fail later. So, like they say, the first step to solving any problem is realizing and acknowledging that you have one. In a similar spirit of that, the first step to improving how you fail is to realize and understand how you fail in the moment already. I, whenever I got a bad grade on something that I felt like I really did well in, I did really well and I got a bad grade, yes, I was curious. And I would go back, but I don't think I would obsess over it. But if I got a bad grade in something that I didn't really enjoy, didn't really care about, like, uh, da, 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 da. history, for instance. I don't like history very much, and I consistently struggle in staying interested and invested in, and engaged in history. I've taken a whole bunch of history courses throughout, and every single one of them has consistently been my worst class. I don't like it. A lot of it is reading textbooks, reading books for knowledge and story, and I can't retain that. <laughs> so, history is not exactly my strong suit. So a lot of my poor grades were in history. But because I'm so uninterested in it, I ended up taking more of the, eh, okay, moving on approach. Which, in hindsight, did not really do a whole lot to improve my later grades. But it wasn't until much later that I realized I had that attitude based on how interested I was in what I was doing. Classes I liked, I was more productive in how I failed, how I responded to failure. Classes I didn't like, not so much. I just didn't really care that much. Because I didn't like it and I was like, oh, I got a bad result on something I didn't really like in the first place, it's even less motivating to try to put in the effort to fix it. Because I didn't have this desire, I didn't like it, so I didn't have the desire to be good at it. And I gotta say, kudos and props to all the people who can push that, push through that, 
who everyone can, to everyone who can push to and strive to want to be good at something that they don't like. If you can put yourself into that mindset, that discipline and mental fortitude, I applaud you. I applaud you because I do not have that. Now, for instance, one of the nuanced, one of the subtle ways that I learned how I fail is when I get back a grade, everyone likes to talk about it. And I need time to really go through and think about every single thing that I got wrong. That's how I fail. And that's how I learn from my failure is by taking the time and going through. If everyone kind of jumps in and starts chatting about it immediately, I'm not ready for that. I'm not prepared. I can't listen to that. And so it took me a while to realize why I felt uncomfortable when like a class of 50, 60, 70, 100 people, we all got our grades back, class ended, and everyone suddenly started pouring over their test and talking about it. I felt uncomfortable. I had to just walk out. I had to leave. I had to move on to my next class. I had to get out of there. I had to get out of the situation where people were talking about the test. And it wasn't until later that I realized why. Because I didn't feel prepared enough and I just didn't like it. I'm not a very competitive person. And so I talked with someone who was rather competitive academically and he said, oh, he couldn't help it. He has to talk about, he has to look over, he has to get everything, and he obsesses over everything he did wrong just so he gets it right. That's his academic competitive nature. He and I were very much opposites of that. I'm not saying that having that guarantees good grades or not having that guarantees bad grades. People are adaptable. People are flexible. People know how to make do with their situations. That's the beauty of human beings. We can adapt ourselves, but we can also adapt the environment to us. And that's, I think, I heard someone quote that a couple years ago. That's one of the things that sets humanity apart from most other creatures on the planet. We can all adapt ourselves to our environment, but humans are one of the few that adapts the environment to us, to ourselves. I thought that was pretty cool. I haven't thought deeply about how true or untrue that may be, but it sounds nice. It sounds cool. But yeah, so now I learned that I can't focus on what I did right when I get it back. I have to give myself time to kind of distance myself, prepare to look into it, and then sit down for a little bit of time and go through by myself piece by piece. If I'm so by the end and like we get our grades back and all my friends knew that they were going to talk about it and they knew that I didn't like it. So when I just walked out, they understood, they knew, they they even accounted for it. They say, "Okay, so we're going to get our test back at the end of the course, end of the end of the class period." And my friends are like, all right, so we'll get it. We'll talk about it. This guy will leave. And then when he comes back, we're done. We'll meet up with him later. And then we'll all, you know, go out to lunch or something. It was, it was nice being understood like that by others. But I had to understand that about myself first in order to communicate it to them in the first place. And that wouldn't have happened without the occasional reflection on why I ended up feeling the way I did, why I behaved the way I did. And I will admit that does take a certain amount of practice of looking inwards. And you, it's rare that you can solve everything about yourself the first time you do it in a very short amount of time. For me, it took time, took several years, took a while of always looking and trying to evaluate, okay, Why am I acting like this? And what can I do to 
either change it or accommodate it. Or improve myself through it. So that's how I fail. I learned how I failed, based, which changed based on how much I liked it. Now how did I change that? Well, the, other, the, the example I just said was I learned that I was uncomfortable, but I learned it was because I didn't like talking about the grace and I distanced myself from it. How else do I fail? How do I fail things that are not as, not as productive, we'll say? Hmm. Well, we can venture, we don't have to stick to the world of academia. Because this learning to learn, it doesn't just apply to schoolwork, neither does learning how to fail. If you're in a da, 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 music performance, like a recital or a concert, and you mess up, I think in a performing environment rather than a testing environment is very, very different. If I fail in a performance, let's say I have a solo, and I completely mess up to the point where even the audience knows that I played it wrong. Normally the audience doesn't know what it should be, so whatever you do, they assume that it's right. If you give them an indication that you messed up, like you make a big grimace, or you shake your head, or you go like, ah dang, and you like, like storm off, or you start crying on stage, they'll know that you messed up. But otherwise, they won't know. They'll think everything was right, as it should be. But personally, you'll know. And so if you mess up, um, I already talked about my, um, my percussion upbringing with all my recommendations for mallets and such. So if I'm playing, say, the timpani, the big tunable drums with the foot pedals, and I mess up in a very obvious way. Let's say it's a very quiet part of the song. They're focusing on the flutes and the clarinets. It's very quiet, very soothing, very slow. And I, I am holding the sticks, getting ready for this next section in a couple minutes. And, you know, you're playing for a while. Your hands get sweaty. Sometimes the stick just slips out of your hands and you drop it. Now let's say your hand's over one of the timpani at the time and you drop the stick. And now you hear clang, 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 boom, boom, boom in the middle of this lovely, beautiful aria. Not aria, that's not the word. This beautiful, slow, quiet, lovely part. Clearly that's a mistake. You drop the stick, it sounds very out of place, and now everyone suddenly looks at you that's a mistake. Eh, it could be it could be jarring to have everyone's attention suddenly on you. Now that's a segue into kind of the third topic, which is similar to the first, I mean similar to the second, but has differences. And that's learning how to recover from mistakes. Now I would say the difference between learning to fail and learning to recover mistakes, the only difference is whether it happens in the moment or not. So I actually got ahead of myself a little bit, so I'm going to go back to just the failure part before we go on to the mistakes part. Learning how to... F actually, am I done? Uh, did I talk a whole lot? Let me touch did I talk about everything I needed to with that one? Da, 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 da. Yeah, I think I did. Learning to fail. Oh, one last thing. One last thing to, to finish it off before we move on. <clears throat> so how do you improve how you fail? If your method, whether desired or not, if your method of failure is very emotionally driven, either with sadness, or rage, or apathy, complete lack of emotion, 
If it's emotionally charged or emotionally driven, it can be very difficult to change because you can't control what you feel. You can control how you express what you feel, and that's really the extent of what you can do, but you can't control what you feel in the first place. That's controlled by your heart, and you have no say over that. But you can certainly control how you express your feelings. You can feel rage, but you might be able to control yourself to not flip the desk or not storm out. Take a few calming breaths and calm yourself down. Now, I'm not saying suppress your emotions. No, that's unhealthy. No, 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 no. I'm saying process your emotions. Let them run their course, but then express that and afterwards in a more constructive way that helps you later on. And failure is not something... Yeah, here's where I picked up. Failure is not limited to academia. It can also be other things. I ventured into the performing arts, but that goes into the more in-the-moment kind of things. But if you're failing at, let's say, you're trying to... Let's see, what's an example of something where you do something and you only learn whether you passed or failed later on, after the moment has passed, other than academia. I'm sure someone out there can come up with an example, maybe something they're living through right now. Oh, perfect. Um, posting a video. Post a video, you put a whole bunch of work into it, a whole bunch of effort. You pour so many hours, so much sleep, uh, sleepless nights, you do all this work, you're very proud of it, you think it's amazing. You post it, two weeks later, two views. One view. No views. And you could consider that as a failure. I'm not sure if I would, but let's just say that you would see that as a failure. You put something out there and it did not do as well as you had hoped. Just like you submitted your test, you get the grade back, it wasn't as good as you hoped, you submitted your video, you get your view count back, and it wasn't as popular or successful as you hoped. You could see that as a failure. Now how do you respond to that? Do you try to make more frequent videos, even if they're shorter and of lower quality, just to get quantity out. Do you stick with what you did? Infrequent, because it takes so much time, and therefore not as many, so low quantity, but the quality is just as much as you can give. Or do you try to get it you know, how do you balance? How do you respond? How do you change your behavior if it needs to be changed at all? Maybe you still see it as a failure, but it's less of a failure than the alternatives. For instance, as a creator, if you say, okay, I put a lot of time to this one video that I think is good quality. It didn't perform as well. However, changing my pattern to do a whole bunch of videos of lower quality just to get the video count up and out there, I would consider a personal failure. I don't know if I would call that selling out, but I would say it's a change, but I don't think it's a change for the right reasons. Some people it's exactly the right change they need or want. Personally, not for me. So. Yes, it's a failure because it doesn't perform as well as it did, but it's less of a failure. It's even more of a failure if I changed because of it, but only to play the metrics, only to play the likes and the views and the other stuff. That doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't amount to much, personally speaking. Now, I'm speaking from a privileged position because I'm not dependent on the success of this YouTube or Twitch channel for income. It's not my livelihood. I have a livelihood outside of this, so this isn't 
This how well my videos do doesn't determine whether I could pay the bills later on. For some people, that's exactly what it determines. And so they have a vested interest in it performing well and getting lots of views, lots of likes, er ergo, lots of revenue. So they can keep living, put food on the table. I am privileged enough to not have to con not, not have to combine my creative ideas with my financial situation or living situation. So I can afford to not be as critical of myself and how I fail from this uh, creator standpoint. But still, the amount of self-reflection, the amount of thinking and looking inwards that you normally apply to an academia situation, it can still help you from a creative standpoint. So even if you've never done it before, even if it's difficult to figure out what exactly you're seeing, what to think about, where to start, learning how to learn, think back to a time where you struggled to learn. Think back to a time where you thought it was super easy try to find the differences between those two situations. Maybe those differences are in the method. Learning how to fail. Something where you failed and you felt destroyed over it. Something where you failed and you couldn't care less. What are the differences between those two situations? Maybe it's method, maybe it's interest, maybe it's who knows what. But by figuring out two different, not quite mirrored, but similar points in your life, similar situations in your life, and figuring out what makes them different, you'd be surprised how much of the differences you can trace back to a personality trait you have, or to something that seems to be continuous or persistent throughout your life. Maybe you'll discover a pattern that you didn't realize was there until you looked at it. So either way, you learn a little more about yourself. And maybe along the way, you'll learn how you learn, and you'll learn how you fail. And then you'll learn how you learn best, and you'll learn how you would like to start failing. This is not to say that you should seek out failure. But it will be figure out how you fail now, does that method of failure help you later on? And if not, what kind of failure method would? And let's see if you can start following that method. For one of my classes, I really struggled. I really struggled. I just did not understand the material. And I did everything I could. I went to office hours almost every single time he offered them. I did all the homework. I went to every class. I sat in the front. I asked questions. The problem was unfamiliarity with the material. It was an advanced senior level, senior college level mathematics theory course, logical theory course. And the most recent math major, it was for math majors, and the most recent math major course I had taken was freshman year. I had taken engineering applied mathematics up until that point, staying kind of out of the theoretical realm. And then I suddenly jump into an advanced theoretical class. I was setting myself up for an uphill battle from the day one. I didn't quite realize it yet. but I did everything. I wrote everything by hand. I sat in the front. I engaged. I tried to teach it to myself, found the gaps, and it was consistently difficult. I learned, I had learned how I had learned by that point. So I tried everything to my advantage. And I learned how I failed at that point by going over kind of on my own. 
and that method normally worked, but in this particular case, it wasn't enough. I had to change how I failed for this one exception, and I failed by reviewing my failures with the teacher present, with a live source of feedback, which I hadn't done before. But this was eye-opening because it allowed the professor and I to learn about kind of how I think and how he thinks, what I struggle with, what I didn't. And by the end, I was able to sort of talk aloud my own understanding, and he was able to understand my language. To the point where he could tell me right away if I'm on the track or if I'm not. The fact that I wasn't familiar with a lot of the fundamental mathematical principles because I hadn't taken any math major courses, it still worked against me, and that never really went away. I never overcame that part. But despite that obstacle, by changing, by understanding how I fail, and realizing that that wasn't helping me in this one case, and being able to change how I failed, I was able to pass the class. Barely, but I passed. And I would not have been able to do that had I not had the experience of self-reflection and the prior knowledge of, I know how I feel. I know how I learn. What will work? What needs to change for this situation? So that's the kind of adaptability that I want to help others get. Now, we're going to jump to the last idea, which is tangentially related. Learning how to recover from mistakes. Now, these mistakes are not in the context of, oh, you do something and then later on you realize how you did. These are more in the moment. And these aren't just occurring in live performances like creative arts, although that's an easy example to convey. But they can also happen academically. But we'll go back to the performance thing. So let's say the whole dropping a timpani mallet on timpani, middle of a quiet part of a song. That's a mistake. How do you recover in the moment? How do you recover live, on the spot? Or how do you respond, really? Maybe not even recover, but how do you respond? Do you run off stage? Do you duck down on the ground so no one can see? Do you pretend it was intentional? Do you pick it up and kind of withdraw into yourself? red-faced, all embarrassed? Do you look like you don't care about the performance? Kind of blow it off, try to act all cool. Too cool for it. How would you respond? And then, naturally, how would you like yourself to respond in those situations? How do you, how do you respond? How do you think you should? respond. Hopefully, and this is my own opinion talking, hopefully you'd venture into the, I would like to respond by recovering from it, rather than just blowing it off. Another instance, and this is a true story, I was in the marching band, big surprise, my... junior year of high school. Yeah, my junior year of high school, and I was playing the marimba, the really big, dark-colored xylophone with a very woody, uh, deep sound, the one that resonates. And I was playing a run, and a run is what you call when you go play the notes up and you play down, you just play a whole bunch of notes really fast in succession. And it was, there were three marimbas, three marimba players, and we were all playing the same run. It was at the very end of the song, and we're playing this run, and I'm holding it in my hand, and in my right hand, 
know how you're supposed to pinch it with the little T. Your thumb goes up, it goes into the, what is the first crease of your index finger to make a little T, and the stick just goes in between that. And you just curl your fingers around it to hold it properly. You're holding that, and you're kind of pinching that. And if you're the faster you play, almost the tighter you pinch, just so you can move the stick that much faster with less actual motion. So you just hit a lot more notes than you normally could. But after several days and weeks of practice with the same stick over and over, and that tight pinching and the sweat in your hand going into the wood, the, I think it's birch, the birch wood of the, of the mallet stick, eventually it'll start to weaken. And so I'm playing this run with two, two mallets, just one in each hand, and I'm going, I think the run ends by you kind of go down the, down the scale, and then you come up the scale, and then you, as you go up, you crescendo, and your arms go wild, and then you start kind of doing a lot slower notes, but they're really loud, exaggerated arm movements, very big arm motions, and I felt it on the way down. I was playing it, and I felt a little separation, a little a little give, a little flex, that Birchwood shouldn't act like that on the way down. And I'm like, okay, so there's a crack. I don't think it's completely separated, but it should last until the end. So I hit down, and now on the way up, you get louder, bigger arm movements, and that's just even flexing this mallet even more until you get to the end, and I get to the big arm wailing, flailing, and as soon as I hit like the first note of that new section, the arm comes up. And when the arm came back down, it was missing the upper half of the stick. So I just stood there for like a millisecond looking at it like, oh, I just broke it in half and it's gone. So in that millisecond, I was, I was tempted to just kind of panic, stand there, just kind of freeze up, and kind of look around like... I was tempted to look for it. Look for it to see if I can reattach it. That, that brief moment of panic gave those little irrational thoughts. You can't reattach. You don't have tape. You can't just sit there in the middle of performance, especially the end of the song where everything's wrapping up. You got to do something. So I literally just went into almost autopilot. I opened my hand, let the remaining piece drop to the floor. There was a bag in front hanging from every marimba with a whole bunch of extras so when you do like four mallets and such. So I just picked up another one and by the time I picked it up it was kind of the end of that flail so I finished the flail and kept the run going, finished out the song, and that, I think, was one of my prouder moments of I, I felt the temptation to just freeze up and not move. Just kind of look around and not really know what to do. But I trusted my instincts, pushed forward, and continued the performance. Now, the funny thing about this was this was an indoor performance. I think because we were supposed to be outdoors, you and me were on the football field of whatever high school that we're visiting who's hosting the competition. <clears throat> but when it's bad weather, they move it to the indoor gymnasium, which is unfortunate because it removes the whole marching choreography component. They're kind of just standing still the entire performance. All the choreography is not used, so you don't get any points for that. But that means that everyone is directly behind us, directly behind the pit, which is in front, which is where I was. And that means everyone can see it, see us, the backs of our heads at least. And we are playing like right two feet away from the bleachers where the judges are sitting. <clears throat> and so we're always taught in the pit to make eye contact, to not keep your eyes on your instrument all the time, to not look like you're in your own little world, but actually look at the judges, look at the audience, look at the conductor, engage, look like you enjoy what you're doing, show off, 
stuff like that adds to the performance value. So when the judge is directly in front of you, you can make serious eye contact as you play, as you have fun. And they might be walking around, talking into their little um, voice recorders, what their adjudication, their judgment is, as they walk around, as you perform. But I'm playing around, and as my arms go up, apparently, I was told this afterwards, but when my hand came up, and it came down without the mallet, the upper half went flying up in a little arc, over, and apparently plopped on the head of the marimba guy next to me. And because this was indoor, and everyone was so close, everybody saw it. They thought that I just let go of the mallet, but it actually snapped. They just were playing along and suddenly they see this little thing fly through the air. Ba -da 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 -da. Wee Bunk. And apparently he was playing along and then he feels this thing hit his head like he kind of looks around a little confused but then he kind of keeps going and obviously the judges who were sitting right in front of us saw the whole thing I was the only one who didn't actually know what happened it was gone I didn't have time to think about where it went I just let go kept going so <clears throat> I recovered from that mistake pretty well, I think. There was another moment in da, 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 second semester, second semester freshman year. I have to think about it differently because high school is measured in years, college is measured in, measured in half years or semesters. So second semester was my first physics course. And I think I did pretty well during the tests. That was my first that was my first exposure to how how college actually grades. My first test got I got back 63%. Yeah. 63% on the test was my first midterm. First exam. Do you know what that grade corresponded to by the end? A solid A almost an A plus because of this wonderful thing called the curve which some college professors choose not to use to the chagrin of many but <clears throat> that was my eye-opening thing to say oh in college a 63 can be an A that's a very strange way of thinking but it worked but I think it was during the second or third exam where I'm writing and the way the physics exams were is that they give you a little word problem and they say okay here's like a practical situation and uh, what's what should this person do or what should this number be or how long should they do this for and you have to use the physics contained within that problem to solve it and you know you write everything down and you get to this point where you've kind of nailed all the concepts you've turned the concepts into equations and now you're just manipulating equations to get a number or a letter it got to the point where I had I think five minutes left of the test one question left five minutes left I'm looking over the problem I think I'm done and I realize I did it wrong. I messed up. And so I had a whole page worth of work that was essentially worthless, wrong. And so I'm kind of sitting there with the realization of, oh, I did this wrong. I have five minutes left. I'm going to get a zero on this problem. And so the temptation was very strong to kind of just sit there, feel sorry for myself, maybe let out a tear or two. And I was tempted to do that. I'm like, five minutes, I can't do much in five minutes. I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And then I was thinking, do it. Just do as much as you can. So I erased 
everything on that page. That took a full minute. And then I just started scribbling frantically what the right things were. And luckily, for a class like that, they're worried more about the concepts than the actual number. So you work in all your equations, they're all variables, they're all letters, and you don't plug in numbers until like the very last step. So the entire page is just manipulating a bunch of letters, numbers only come in at the end. So I'm just writing all these different letters, all these equations, and the lucky thing is that when I realized what I did wrong, I knew exactly what I had to do to do it right. So I was able to just stream of consciousness, just write down everything that I had to do. And I think I was able to get to the very end. Um, I, w I didn't have time, I don't think. I don't think I had t I might have a time, I can't remember, to plug in the numbers. But the answer may have been all variables anyway. And that's how I recovered. I had that moment of my response is just freeze and give up. But I kind of got a second wind, entirely self-induced, and I pushed through, and I ended up getting a pretty good score for that problem and a great grade for the test overall. So you could always say, oh, the lesson learned here is just don't give up. There's always a chance. There's always time. But here, the lesson was don't be ashamed of yourself for having that initial I want to give up moment, because that's natural. What you do after that is what determines the outcome. So I'm not ashamed, and you shouldn't be ashamed, to have the moment, or to even feel the temptation to give in to that moment. But the ability to say, you know what? No, I can do this, I will do as much as I can, I'm not going to give up just yet. That, the ability to do that, is one of the most important things about recovering from your mistakes. The unwillingness to just give up. And that can be very difficult for people who aren't who don't have practice with that, who aren't used to doing that, to talking themselves through it. And if you don't know what, what to say to yourself or what to think or the, the, the kind of self-routine to go through to put yourself in that mindset, it can be difficult. But once you nail it, once you get that down, you'll find that you can keep playing the run. You can answer that question with five minutes to go. And you can end up with a performance that does pretty well and a great story to go with it. You can end up with a pretty good scoring test and pride in yourself that you didn't give up. You didn't abandon hope because you thought you couldn't do it in five minutes. You didn't abandon hope because if something unexpected happened and you're performing, hundreds of people looking at you you just keep going. You just keep going. So that's learning how to learn, learning how to fail, and learning to recover from your mistakes. I would say that if you have not developed a sense for each of these three things by the time you graduate college, then college has failed you. But I'm not so confident in saying that, so I'm not going to commit to saying that. Instead, I'm going to say it's an ongoing process. Because as I learned in my senior year, you can have a pretty established way to learn how to fail, and then you have to suddenly adapt it for one particular class, a dang math class. <laughs> or you can have a pretty good way of learning how to recover. Let me, hold on, let me think of an example of where I did not recover very well. Uh, da -da, da -da 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 -da. I feel like I should have a lot of these earlier in my life. I feel like I should have, 
What did I make a mistake in the moment and I did not recover well from it? Oh, yeah, okay. I got it. So, I used to take piano lessons and there was one or two piano recitals and I, I hated the recitals because I got such butterflies in my stomach. I was so nervous and I learned this about myself. It's the same kind of thing that happens when I practice piano on my own. I feel great. I know confident. As soon as I press the record button on my phone, I freeze up. I can't do it perfectly anymore. Even if I did it perfectly like five times ago, ten seconds ago. Five times in a row, ten seconds ago. The knowledge that I'm being recorded or watched live that whatever I do cannot be just erased and redone. Even though recording, yes, it could be. But, you know, that live aspect of it changes me. I feel myself thinking differently. I can recognize that. It was to a much greater degree when you're sitting there as a kid, the piano recital, a whole bunch of people, mostly strangers, because they're mostly the parents of other people, that are also taking lessons that you don't know. And your parents that you're going to have to talk to later. So if you make a mistake, they might bring it up. All this stuff. This a whole... And your teacher standing like right there. If you play it well, it's great. But there was a couple times I remember where I made a very clear mistake. Now, other people had gone before me. Other people had made mistakes during theirs. So I'm not the first to make the mistake, but making the mistake in the performance threw me off for the entire rest of the play. Because I, I had no time to process it. I was still playing, and but I hadn't quite gotten to the mindset of pushing through. So I kind of just like struggled through it it's like I was playing great, 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 one mistake. Struggle, 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 mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake, struggle, struggle. It was, it was a repeating thing. Whenever I had a piano recital, make one mistake, the whole thing goes to pot. I just played a whole bunch of Pokemon Sword, so that's where the phrase comes from, going to pot. Um, but yeah, that was back when I, I did not recover well at all. But I think I've improved since then. And I don't think it was any targeted practicing of that skill. It just happened as I matured. As I was, a as I was able to deal with things more calmly. And give myself the time I need to process it. Rather than trying to, f to rush myself. To force myself to make hasty fixes. Without really thinking about if it's going to work or not. Sometimes your instincts guide you well. Playing the mallet, losing it, I didn't think about it. I just followed my instincts, but my instincts served me well to get another one and keep going. The exam, I didn't use instincts, I thought about it. I thought about, okay, if I try again, can I put the right stuff down? Yes, I can. Let's do it. So everyone recovers differently, and how you learn, how you fail, how you recover will change over time, whether you practice it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, whether you want it to or not. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. If you don't fail that often, you never practice how to fail. If you don't make mistakes in the moment that often, you never really develop how to recover from them. And if you don't sit down and learn something so often, very often, very often, you won't really learn how you learn well, or how your habits of learning change over time. You can take other ideas from this to say, well, that means you should always be learning something new, so you always have a chance to learn how you learn. You should always be trying new stuff so you always fail at first and learn how you fail. You should always be trying to do live things so when you make a mistake, you learn how to recover in the moment. But I'm not going to go so far as to say that's the lesson here. I'm just going to say a little introspection, a little looking inwards at yourself. But in the context of these three things, 
how you learn, how you fail, how you recover, will definitely help you having that insight, having that knowledge about yourself will help you in situations that will, I guarantee, will catch you off guard. You will not expect to use this information when you actually need to use it. But it will help you. Whew. Well, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. That is my philosophy for this week. Uh, let's see, it is December 10th right now. 17th, 24th, 31st. Uh, 24th and 31st, I will probably not be streaming because I'll be spending time with on the holiday with family and such. Next week, we'll see. We'll see next Friday if I have time to do something. I might, I probably will, but you'll see it scheduled on the, on the channel. Probably, and hopefully, a couple days in advance. The time, again, super consistent guy here, might change once, twice, or maybe three times, but I will show in the description every change that I make and why. Uh, at least every change I make, maybe not why. But if you look in and you see why, oh, it's a different time, no, you weren't mistaken, I changed it, here's when I changed it, and yada, yada, yada. So, I have my other creative project to get back to, so I will call it for this week. Thank you everyone so much for watching. This has been your commanding philosopher, Poison Tongue, signing out. And remember, keep on making.